Thank you so much for uh, having me here. Um, first, can we get the lights and I'll, I'll play a, a quick one minute uh, read. <coughs> on creating tools to unlock creativity and storytelling. Of course, that's what all of, all of you do as well, um, creating and using those tools. Um, but we're also interested in doing it for most people. Um, and sometimes that diverges a little bit from what we need to do for, for this audience. Uh, on the right there is Frank Wong. He's uh, the founder of DJI. He founded it in 2006. And he has roots in, in piloting RC helicopters, um, and specifically DJI was founded really uh, after he wrote uh, a RC helicopter autopilot. So he had this dream to fly an unmanned helicopter with a camera on it around Mount Everest, uh, which he managed to do in 2009. And on the left is Professor Lee, who is his mentor at the University of uh, Science and Technology in Hong Kong, which is where DJI was, was essentially founded. He would sneak off uh, after class to work on his new company. So in, in the early days, DJI had a history in selling helicopter and multi-copter kits into the hobby market, including flight controllers, all the parts you see here. Uh, these were really designed to be built at home by enthusiasts, made for tinkerers, and um, that's something a little bit different than what DJI is doing now, although this, all of this equipment is still being used and is very popular in the hobby market. Uh, this is the DJI Spreading Wings S1000. This is the current flagship product, this, well, the current flagship flying product. Uh, it's, a, it's an octocopter with uh, a Zenmuse gimbal. This is very commonly used uh, in film, filmmaking and production. Um, it features both a folding frame and folding propellers for portability, so you can literally just drop this thing into a Pelican case and roll it into your van. Um, it's designed to be used with very specific lenses. The Zenmuse gimbals are, are designed for specific cameras and specific lenses. Um, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, here are some specifications. I don't want to get into this too much because you can find this on our website, which is dji.com. Um, but the maximum recommended takeoff weight is about 11 kilograms, so we're talking 25 pounds or something. Um, as I mentioned, there's specific camera support. At the moment, our gimbals are made for the Canon 5D Mark II and Mark III, Panasonic GH3, GH4, and the Blackmagic Design Pocket Cinema Camera, all with wide-angle lenses. So at the moment, we support the Canon EF 24mm 2.8 and the Olympus 12mm uh, F2 primes. Uh, S1000 goes about 45 miles per hour at maximum speed. Now, these are, these are specs based on our autopilot in some kind of stabilized mode. You can, of course, fly any of these manually if you want, and some of my friends do this for fun, and they're capable of going much faster, but of course, they usually crash by the end of the day. So, perhaps not recommended. Uh, the sweet, sweet spot right now for frames of this size carrying cameras is about 15 minutes of flight time. I've been told by a lot of people who are on sets using these products that they usually don't need more than that. And we get a lot of requests by people doing search and rescue and other, uh, you know, other things like that that want, you know, 50-minute, an hour, two-hour flight times. 
Um, you know, civilian multi-copters just aren't there yet. Um, so 15 minutes is pretty typical right now. You can, of course, configure these to carry more batteries for longer flight times. You don't get exactly a multiplier because, of course, batteries weigh something, so you have to lift more. So there's usually a sweet spot, and, um, but you can load them, if, load them up with batteries if you really need long flight times. Most people ask about the range. Um, we always have some kind of specified range for radio configurations, but the configurations are really so variable that you need to do this testing on your own or ask someone who's an expert because the ranges will really vary from you know, 100 meters if you do something badly you know, to, to many miles if you have the right setup. Uh, recently, the S1000 uh, got a baby brother. This is the S900 hexacopter. Mm -hmm. Now this is used with the same gimbals, uh, the, two of the, the two smaller gimbals, the ones for the Panasonic GH3, GH4, and the, black, the BMD pocket cinema camera. You can expect longer flight times typically with a hexacopter than an octocopter for the same small, the same small payload. So DJI is most well known for the Phantom line. And um, the, uh, this was announced in January of 2013 or at the very end of 2012. It's a small cop uh, quadcopter with an included GoPro mount. Um, now what, we're, what I'm showing here are two different versions of the Phantom 2. The one on the left is designed to be used with a GoPro, and the one on the right features an integrated stabilized uh, camera. Now, all of these gimbals are three-axis stabilized, so they stabilize roll, pitch, and yaw. Now, the reason these became so popular is that they were the first multi-copters to work out of the box, which means that you can literally buy one, take one out of the box, and put it in the air in a few minutes. Now, I've had some interesting conversations with some people here about what that means, <laughs> and it's a little bit complicated. We can get into that later. Um, they're pretty affordable, um, affordable in air quotes. Um, about $1,200 with a, a stabilized camera, camera and gimbal. And uh, they're relatively safe, uh, especially when compared to other products in the market. We use GPS-based navigation as a fundamental when you're outside. Um, we feature return to home and auto land if it senses any problems like RC control signal loss, for example. Um, we've also done some things proactively, like prevent use around airports. Uh, so these things have the, the fly safe feature, which has a certain radius around big airports where it has an, uh, the, the ceiling will drop until you hit a certain radius around the airport, inside which you cannot fly. Of course, if you have a job to fly in the airport, this becomes a problem. So. At the moment, it, it affects uh, a good portion of our product line, certainly the consumer products. The Phantom goes about 30 miles an hour uh, maximum, uh, 13 to 18 minutes of flight time, depending on how you fly. Um, our specs give the range at about a third to a half of a mile. Uh, in practice, I've flown a mile or more uh, on a stock system. Again, these are people are doing all sorts of modifications to get these to fly further but you're really affected by battery, you're, you're really limited by battery time more than anything else. We've seen exponential popularity and growth in, in people buying phantoms and using them for interesting things. I, I went on YouTube yesterday and did a search for the words phantom and aerial. It returned 300,000 videos. So people are doing some pretty, they're posting, well, most of these are backyard test flight videos which are probably some of the most boring videos you'll ever see in your life. Um, and I run, I run a group for, on Facebook for quadcopters, and the first rule is don't, test, you know, don't post your test flight shots. Yeah. Nobody wants to see them, except for you. Okay, so really quickly, I want to talk about how we got here. So what happened? You know, we have 300,000 Phantom videos on YouTube, and a year and a half ago, the Phantom didn't exist. Um, and really, smartphones happened. If you think about what's in a smartphone, you have a lot of computing power. You have all sorts of different kinds of sensors. You have an IMU with accelerometers and, and gyros, gyros, barometer for altitude, magnetometer, compass. Uh, you have cameras on them, more than one camera frequently. Um, they also use very dense power, you know, power plants, like they have lithium polymer batteries, which are very which are normal now in pretty much every electronic device. And you have this crazy race for miniaturization until iPhone 6. You know, so <laughs> everything's going small. And it turns out that all of these same components 
are used in small multi-copters. And, and they're all commoditized, so they're very cheap and they're easy to source. So the result is that multi-copters are now on Moore's law, which is the, you know, the law that says that computers get more powerful, twice as powerful every 18 to 24 months. So you're seeing multi-copters hop onto that exponential curve and, and they're, gonna, they're gonna stay on that curve. So we are really focused on simplicity, reliability, and safety. And the uh, flight controllers that are in our systems are really advanced. Uh, I said before, GPS navigation is sort of primary. And that means that you have GPS position hold. Now, we've combined that with virtual controls. And I'm saying virtual because in the early days, if you were to throttle up on a, on a remote control, uh, you would throttle up. And there was a direct link to throttle. And so what DJI did was change that so that when you, point, when you push the stick up, you're actually saying, go higher. You're not saying throttle up anymore. You know, so all of these controls are, were moving back to a higher level. And combined with the spring-loaded throttle stick, and uh, we were the first to do this, um, and it seems like a, a very basic thing now, but at the time it was very controversial. Uh, what that means is if you just let go of everything, the aircraft stays in the same place. And it stays in the same place horizontally and at the same altitude. This is, of course, assuming you have GPS lock. Um, another thing it does is it returns home if something goes wrong. So, you know, if you turn the radio off, uh, it doesn't follow the sky, it doesn't follow some pre-programmed uh, algorithm, it will actually return to your takeoff point and automatically land. And you can take, you can regain control at any time uh, if you want to. So a couple other things that, uh, that were done that seem totally obvious now is to make all of the propellers self-tightening. This seems very simple. I mean, for many, many years, half of the propellers were self-tightening and half were trying to spin themselves loose <laughs> at all times. You know, when I started, I had this happen every once in a while. Uh, a propeller would just fly off in midair and, you know, the results would be bad. Um, so, of course, all, all four now are self-tightening. Um, the, the batteries have gone cartridge style. They're smart, meaning they have electronics embedded to handle charging. Um, you don't have to buy a dedicated charger and hook it up to a 12-volt power supply. You know, all the things that you did before, um, we've gotten rid of uh, pretty much because they were, they were a pain in the ass. Like you, um, nobody liked them, but nobody did anything about it. Uh, this is all toolless. Um, it makes the product safer, um, and and most I mean very importantly for this car, they, they deploy very quickly. So the Phantom has gone viral. Uh, this is one of my favorite videos that was shot here in LA. Um, because of its si the Phantom's size and cost and versatility, independent filmmakers have really flocked to it. Um, this is a little Superman video by Corridor Digital. Uh, it has over 15 million views. So, I mean, this was shot with a, a Phantom 2 and a GoPro. And, uh, you know, now you can buy something like this for maybe $1,500, including the FPV, the, the Live View um, system. So pretty impressive. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about camera stabilization. Um, our, our 3X's Zenmuse gimbals were first announced in July of 2012. Now, these are all very short time frames. I mean, 2012, uh, they were announced for Sony NEX cameras. <coughs> these are 3X's gimbals that use high torque brushless motors. Um, at this price point, during that time, most of the gimbals were using servos still, which were very laggy, and um, they couldn't really stabilize in real time. They would sort of correct your horizon at some point. Um, and gimbals really totally changed the way that, that we think um, in terms of what kind of video multi-copters can produce. Uh, so a year later, in the summer of 2013, the Zenmuse gimbal for GoPro 3 was released, um, and this really made stable aerial video in the consumer world the norm. I mean, you don't see shaky aerial video anymore because 3X's three, three gimbals uh, like ours are out there. I mean, you can buy a knockoff uh, gimbal for 
eighty dollars, you know, shipped to your house. Pretty impressive. Um, at NAB this year, we announced the Ronin. There's one outside. You can you can check it out. It's handheld. I won't go into it here, but it has a sixteen pound payload and uses a lot of the same technology that we put into the aerial systems, including cartridge style batteries. You know, it's completely toolless. Uh, a lot was a lot of thought was given to uh, how you might use it in the field and how you might service it. So in um, at NAB, uh, also we announced the uh, Phantom 2 Vision Plus. You saw a picture of that earlier. Now, this is a special version of the Phantom 2 that, offer, that has the first ever integrated stabilized camera. So the integrated being the key word. Um, it's a 1080p 30 camera uh, at, um, and it shoots 14 megapixel DNG raw stills. Um, and, you know, the question we asked ourselves was, you know, why, why are we stabilizing land cameras? You know, the land cameras have all this extra mass, like metal frames and grips, uh, batteries, LCDs, viewfinders, buttons. You don't need any of that stuff for, for aerial work. Typically, you can't reach the camera and touch it, so you don't need any of it. Um, I mean, that, if you try to stabilize all that, it increases the size of the gimbal motors. It increases everything uh, in, in your aerial system all the way up to the frame. So the idea is to split the camera up into two parts. There's a small, light lens and sensor package, which is the only thing that's being stabilized, and that makes the gimbal smaller and lighter, which of course makes the entire aircraft smaller and lighter. Um, so the, end, the effect is that you have longer run times, increased portability, um, and because the cameras are designed for aerial use, they can be controlled remotely uh, fundamentally. You don't have to hack, you don't have to install some weird firmware for a Canon camera and, uh, and try to control power. So the other thing that we did was integrate smartphones into the whole ecosystem. So the Vision Plus uses a Wi-Fi range extender. Of course, this can have issues if you're in a Wi-Fi rich environment. Um, 800 meters is you know, sort of our current published uh, range. If you're out in the middle of nowhere on, you know, in a, on, a, on the ocean or something, you can get 2,000 meters uh, pretty easily. Um, one of the main benefits is that we have real-time live view or FPV that works out of the box. Uh, to your phone, we have built-in telemetry. These are all the safety things you need to know, like how much battery life do you have left. Uh, that's not measured in voltage, which is how you know how we read how uh, hobbyists are doing it. But there's actually a percentage, very useful. Um, again, these seem very simple, but they're not for this industry. Um, and uh, we have ground station integration, so you can actually look at a map or a satellite map and tap your waypoints in and just ask it to fly. And it will take off by itself and fly the waypoints while you, while you retain camera control. And speaking of camera control, you have shutter release, exposure compensation, intervalometer. Sort of the things you would expect uh, a point-and-shoot camera to have are the things you can do right now on a, something like a Vision Plus. So, of course, we talked about paralinks and how the frequencies are typically split up for radio control and wireless transmission of other signals. We do the same thing. So on the Vision Plus, the RC control is actually at 5.8, which would probably clash with the Paralink, um, because we're using Wi-Fi for that video signal and telemetry. And finally, for fun, probably not for this crowd, because we're Wi-Fi connected to the, the vehicle, we can download pictures and share them instantly. This is something that a lot of people aren't doing. I'll talk really quickly about um, our wireless HD video um, solution, which is called Lightbridge. Um, we actually, we work at, at 2.4 gigahertz, and um, we're not designed to be zero latency, nor are we designed to be uncompressed. Um, we're really designed uh, to give you a very high quality local signal for FPV, um, and uh, to support some of the things that, that RC pilots might be interested in. So for example, you can put dual simultaneous, simultaneous video streams onto one channel, so if you have a pilot flying, and a, um, and a cameraman, a camera person, you can have them both on the same signal, along with all the metadata, the telemetry uh, via on-screen display, and radio control. So all of this stuff uh, you can funnel through the, the connection that Lightbridge has uh, between the air end and the ground ends. Um, we, feature, we have HDMI video out. Um, you can also plug in any smart device, uh, iOS or Android device, and see video and telemetry. 
uh, from the box. Um, multiple receivers supported. Um, I don't actually know what our published range <laughs> specifications are because they keep changing, but uh, I used it the other day and got about two kilometers with the stock antennas. This was in like a very clean wireless environment and uh, with nothing in the way. Um, of course, the price is the main draw for, for HD wireless uh, transmission system. It's pretty inexpensive. Of course, it costs more than a Phantom, but uh, that's, what you, that's, what, that's, the, that's the situation right now. Now, a couple of observations about what's happening in the industry. On the one hand, you have mainstream, sort of pseudo-mainstream consumer products like the Phantom, which are sold ready to fly. They're completely integrated now. Uh, they use small camera sensors, though, like point-and-shoot sized. Um, and they favor ease of use. So, you know, when we tune these systems, we really tune them so that they're hard to crash. And when we have a lot of crashes, we make them more conservative to prevent more people from crashing. Um, I'm so glad that in the introduction, Robert talked about not being able to account for stupid people. It's really difficult. You, know, you have people trying to do things with these all the time, like take them out of the box and throttle up. Um, so we're trying to do as much as we can to prevent um, those from being issues. On the other side, we have um, professional grade systems, you know, for us, which doesn't include things like carrying a RED and Alexa yet anyway. Um, they're typically sold in kit form. You need technical expertise to build and support them. They're highly customizable. They use, you know, cameras that have larger camera sensors uh, up to full frame, and they favor power and flexibility. So the question is, what happens in the middle? You know, we're, we're seeing uh, companies sort of creep up from the consumer end and try to move down from the professional end. And I'm really interested in this space because everybody's interested in better image quality, but they don't want to service the equipment as much nor, or rely perhaps on a technical expert that requires a lot of knowledge. You're always gonna need someone there who knows what they're doing. Um, but at the moment, you really need a specialist. So what might be in the future? Well, one of the things, <laughs> okay, this may be a little ambitious, um, but you know, the point is that we want larger and better sensors in the integrated systems that are designed for aerial use. So we want refined camera control in the air without having to hack your way through it or rely on other kinds of systems that, that control it. Um, we want better stabilization, you know, support for longer focal lengths in the air and even zoom. So zoom is a, is a problem because the weight of the camera shifts, typically shifts around when you zoom a lens, and the gimbals need to be perfectly balanced for, for um, you know, to work the best. Um, another thing we're really interested in is modularity. You know, you should be able to swap sensors, swap payloads really easily without having to rebuild your aircraft. So in terms of safety, redundancy is a big issue. You know, at the moment, multicopters are really fragile. You know, hexacopters and octocopters can often stay in the air and come down without hurting anybody if you lose a, a motor or something. None of them survive full power failure. Um, and so we need, we need ways to make sure that if one system fails, you're not going to fall out of the sky. Now, there are some kind of primitive solutions right now like DropSafe, which is actually something that we sell. It's a, it's a parachute. And um, it's not designed to save your aircraft. It's designed to reduce the speed as it falls down. Uh, so you really, it's really designed to pr protect people and equipment underneath. Um, so drop speed reduction hardware. Um, now sensor improvements, you know, we're, again, we're on that computer Moore's Law, and uh, that means that sensors are going to become higher quality, and they're going to deliver more diverse data, different kinds of data than we're, we're getting now, all, all of which the flight controller can use to make your flying more safe.
Now, better positioning, this is something that we're really interested in. We have GPS, which is pretty sloppy now, but there are some new forms of GPS coming to <coughs> the market that are centimeter, that have centimeter precision. Those are very interesting. There are also, there's also a lot of research in non-GPS based positioning systems, which could be used indoor or, or outdoor in environments where you have like tree cover or something like that. Uh, flight control improvements, so better stabilization using all that new sensor data. Um, sense and avoid, this is the holy grail for, for manufacturers. You really want to tell the system, you know, don't allow me to fly into stuff. So if I'm flying towards a wall, you should maybe not let me do it. Um, unless you mean to do it. Um, also, policy that makes sense. This is something that's missing in the USA. It exists in other countries who have pretty reasonable policies. Um, and we're behind, and it doesn't look like we're going to catch up anytime soon. But this is something that this group can really help with, because uh, we need to put pressure on the FAA and other bodies to do something <coughs> reasonable, which is really what, what all of us want. Autonomy is going to be really interesting. So you can imagine ground station improvements that allow for complex path planning. You can imagine recording flights per playback. If you had a centimeter precise GPS and you, you hired an expert pilot to fly something, you could get pretty close. It's not going to be the same as getting the exact shot, um, but at least you could fly the same shot over and over without you know, having to have a, a pilot actively flying. I think computer vision and real-time image analysis are going to be really big. Uh, in making all of this work, especially for things like sense and avoid. <coughs> There's this mythical follow me that has been really popular lately. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of Kickstarter projects that have gotten a lot of funding touting follow me. Um, we haven't done it. We can do it, but we haven't done it because we think these things will follow you into stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what's going to happen. And what happens for us is we get lots of complaints saying, you know, you, you crashed my... No, nah, actually you crashed it. <laughs> so, um, and then autonomous smart path plan planning, I've talked to some researchers, researchers who are working on this. They want to take what's in your heads, or cinematographers' heads, and, and make it easier for you to express yourselves in the hardware. So you could perhaps tell a vehicle in higher level terms what you're interested in, you know, always keep the sun behind me, you know, these sorts of things, and, and have the vehicle assist you when, when you're shooting. Okay, this is something that's really interesting. So think about 3D mapping for flight planning. There are some companies now, and you just fly, fly around with the camera on, and it creates a 3D map uh, automatically. And uh, now you have a 3D map. And you can imagine using that 3D map now to do complex path planning um, in your camera movements from a multi-copter. So these images were actually all shot with a Phantom 2 Vision Plus. Um, and this is the 3D map that was created by Pix4D. Uh, they're working really hard on this problem. Okay, software specialization. So, multicopters are just payload positioning systems. Right now, they're really not much more than that. You know, they keep themselves in the air, they help you to fly them relatively safely. And we have a bunch of dedicated service providers already for vertical industries, like this industry, like in agriculture, that are helping to customize hardware and software to ensure success in this field. Um, I think what we're going to see is that hardware will likely become commodities, just like phones and cameras and computers are, except perhaps in really small niches or in the high end. You know, the, the hardware will just standardize. So we can expect to see specialization via a software app economy. So, you know, the same way you go to the app store and buy a dedicated app to help you do whatever you want to do, um, we can imagine that sort of economy around around multicopters. So this is all, these are all things that, are, that people we're talking to are working on. We're not sure which parts will survive or succeed, um, but they're, they're pretty interesting. Now this next part is, um, is something I hadn't planned to. So Dick asked, he really wanted to see something that had never been seen. <laughs> Show us footage that's never been seen. And luckily, um, last week I went, well, on Saturday I went to Iceland, or on Friday, um, because on, so I left on Thursday, on Wednesday I got a call from a friend saying I can get you to the volcano, it's erupting, and so on Thursday morning I hopped on a plane and we went there and it's, you know, it's a long flight and then it was a 12 hour, 15 hour drive. Uh, we couldn't drive in uh, because there's sort of a ring road around the volcano 
Uh, and the Rangers say that's the closest cars can come. But they did say that we could walk in and that uh, although they didn't recommend it, we could walk all the way up to the edge of the lava, which is right, right there, very close to here. So we just did a couple flights. We ended up flying right over the, the, the rim of the caldera, looking straight down. Um, so we have really great video. <laughs> funny because every time we flew over it, I would lose radio signal completely because presumably from the ash rubbing against each other generated an aesthetic, you know, which creates lightning in that environment. Um, and also molten lava is theorized to be charged as well. So I was actually trying to get closer, but it wouldn't let me. <laughs> you know, we had like a preservation of life instinct or something. <laughs> uh, but I finally met, you know, remember those shots are all fisheye, GoPro fisheye shots. So they're very close. Um, and during the last flight, I lost video and it never came back. And I thought, oh, it's gone. Um, so I, you know, I initiated failsafe. And four minutes later, the lights came back and I saw it. And so this is the moment it landed. And the front of the GoPro is melted. So the camera it doesn't work. And it's charging, though. <laughs> um, and the, the, the card was fine. So a lot of that footage that you saw came from that last flight. Um, so it was, I was pretty amazed to see Return to Home working so well. I mean, we pretty much relied on it to get the aircraft back. And there was also a lot of air traffic here during the day, so most of our flights happened at night. Helicopters stopped flying, and the planes are all really high altitude, so we definitely wanted to avoid being in the air at the same time. Um, so, you know, this is this happened, uh, I just got back, I guess, two days ago, two nights ago. Um, this was on Saturday, it was one long 20-hour day when we were out there. And, um, you know, for me this was just, it was amazing to see how uh, how these new tools can enable us to do things on a daily basis that no one has ever done. I mean, the fact that almost anyone could get one of these and do something that no one's seen before. You know, these low altitude aerials are are really unexplored uh, in cinematography, and um, you know, so and I work for the company. I'm constantly amazed by it. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much.